The information discussed by the host and guests on this talk show is meant to be informational only. Listening or calling in to ask questions for our guests does not create a patient-doctor relationship. Rely on your own doctor or health care provider's medical advice to treat or diagnose any conditions you may have. Nothing discussed on this talk show is meant to replace your doctor's medical advice. You should never stop your current medical treatments or delay getting medical treatment because of anything presented in this program. If you want more information about a medical condition or treatment discussed on this program, talk to your doctor. It's time for Health Check with Heidi Gottman, a daily dose of health and wellness information. Call or text Heidi your questions at 373-1220. That's 373-1220. And now here's Heidi Gottman. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Health Check. I'm Heidi Godman. Hope you're doing well on this beautiful day. We have a great program lined up for you today. Listen to this. In our weekly Brain Boost, we'll speak with Dr. Dean Sutherland about a new study suggesting that blows to the head can cause numerous small swellings along the length of certain brain cells. And we're going to find out what that means and why we all need to take this a little seriously when we get concussions and things like that. So we're going to be finding out about these mild traumatic brain injuries, concussions, and how they affect us according to this new study. Also a little later in the program, we're going to be talking about a really neat, fun fundraiser coming up for people who have pets, kind of a do-it-yourself thing. You're going to want to hear all about this. So stay tuned for that. But we are going to start today by finding out about some of the latest anti-aging strategies that people are going to MDs for, and specifically a type of a dermatologist who who focuses on the aesthetics, the, the beauty or the appearance of things. And you can go to one of these aesthetic dermatologists to try to look younger or improve your look. A lot of people go to these MDs because they have some chronic health conditions, and they need help with them. Today, we're going to be talking about things that are kind of fun, sort of anti-aging uh, and and things that happen because of aging. So we're going to talk all about that. My guest is Dr. Manjula Jegasothi. She's a Harvard and Yale-trained aesthetic dermatologist and the founder of the Miami Skin Institute. Hi, Manjula. Hi, Heidi. Thank you for having me again on your show. Hi. Always fun to have you on the program. You are, you're always ahead of the curve, I think, on, on all of the latest treatments. And, and I want to start out by talking to you about something that we don't think of as we're getting older, but it really is happening to a lot of older people. They're losing their eyebrow hair and their eyelashes. Tell me a little about yes. that. I don't know if you remember, but when you were when you were a child, do you remember your grandmother, or perhaps even if you had a great grandmother, always penciled in their eyebrows? And I always used to wonder whether that was a fashion, or well, you know, that was something they did because they wanted to do it. And I always wondered why. Right, right. <laughs> and, and what you you don't realize is that you actually lose about seventy five to ninety percent of your eyebrow hairs. Um, in the decades going from 40 to 80. Why and, is that? Uh, what, what happens? Is it hormones? Yes, it's hormonal. The, the reduction in estrogen actually causes a miniaturization of the hair follicle in those areas. This is it kind of does it on your head hair, but my, on your scalp hair, but much to a much lesser degree. The miniaturization of the eyebrow hair follicles is much more pronounced in all kinds of women and of all ethnicities and, and, and skin types. And the same goes for your eyelash hair, too. You lose about 50% of your eyelash volume and length. So if you started out as a blonde or a redhead with thin eyelashes, you know, you're down to almost nothing as you get older. Gosh, and so how does that affect us health-wise? Um, you know, so health-wise, in terms of your eyelashes, they protect your eyes from foreign objects, uh, sand, dust, et cetera, from getting into the eye. Um, and in terms of the eyebrows, we also think that that whole area, the sort of the brow bone and the eyebrow itself, prevents things from, so, such as things that you apply to your forehead, such as sunscreen, we'll say, um, prevents it from getting in your eyes. So they're all there. Those structures are there to protect the eyes in general. Okay. So if you don't have hair on your eyelashes, your eyelash hair, you've lost that, or your eyebrow hair, are your eyes more in jeopardy of, of different uh, toxins getting in or, or air Foreign pollution? Body. Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. that a problem? I definitely is. I think that's why we see that happening more often in older people. 
Um, and then, like I said, you have to be careful and apply less of whatever it is you used to apply, whether it's sunscreen or even makeup, to your forehead area because if your eyebrows are not as present, then more of it is likely to cause slippage into the eye area. Okay, so as you're getting older and losing your eyebrow and eyelash hair, probably putting your eyes, making them a little more vulnerable. But but really, that's not what we're thinking about when we look in the mirror. We're thinking, oh no, what's happening to my eyebrows and my eyelashes? It's a huge cosmetic issue. Can you do anything for that? Well, number one is I'm always telling, when I first started doing laser hair removal back in the 1990s, I would have patients, because back then, having very thin eyebrows, even, you know, when you were in your 20s and 30s, was very trendy. And so I had patients who would ask me to uh, laser, you know, all but a thin strip of their eyebrow hairs or in, and in between, too. And I said, you never know. I don't think it's a good idea. Just because I remember the days when Brooke Shields was trendy and having thick eyebrows was trendy. And so I never did it. And now I'm so glad I didn't because I still have these patients. And now they're losing hair because their eyebrow hair is because they're in their 40s and 50s. And they're like, thank God I didn't get most of it taken off permanently because at least I can grow a little bit back in. And they're doing procedures now. Perhaps you've heard of microplaning. No, no. What is that? Microplaning is really popular in Miami, and I'm sure it's going to be coming to the west coast of Florida in the next year or so. It's done by an electrologist or perhaps a permanent makeup artist, but it's different from permanent makeup. It's an actual technique where they use uh, carbon particles. So it's, it's like a tattoo, but not implanted as deeply, and they actually paint little hairs into the area of the eyebrows. So it looks they look a lot more natural than using a pencil or using even a tattoo or permanent makeup. And that's kind of the trend now for women, you know, 40 and over who are just not, you know, who lost a lot of their eyebrow hair and didn't have a lot to begin with to have thicker brows. So that's called microplaning? Microplaning. Microplaning. Is it safe? It's very safe. Um you know, again, it's it's carbon, so it's sort of the same material that you you know pencils are made of. Um, if you're, you know, you should definitely do a test site to make sure you're not allergic to it. Um, it only persists about six to twelve months, so I always think that things that don't last forever are safer than things that last forever. Um, and it's done very superficially in the skin, which is why it wears off. Sure. I guess I'm just thinking about tattoos and some of the health risks that go along with that, you know, the risk for developing hepatitis C and and things like that. But there wouldn't be anything associated with microplaning. This is not applied with a needle. It's applied with uh, almost a sort of a a non, a a blunt um, probe, very similar to what the electrologists use. They, They actually literally put a little blunt probe into the hair follicle and electrocute that that hair follicle so that you don't grow hair. This is the opposite of that. They put a similar probe with a little bit of this carbon on it, and they they draw a tiny hair coming from that follicle. So Mm -hmm. it's it's pretty superficial. And does it last forever? No, about 6 to 12 months, as I said. And most people closer to the six-month mark, which is, again, of something I like about it because I think that makes it safer. Terrific. All right, so that's potentially one solution for the eyebrows. What about for eyelashes? So for eyelashes, you know, our first line of treatment is Latif, uh, which is a solution, a topical solution made by Allergan, which is the, who are the manufacturers of Botox, cosmetic and Botox. Um it was, Latif was originally a glaucoma medication. It was an actual eye drop um, that patients found when they were using it for, it was used for glaucoma. Uh, it's about 20 years old now, I think. And um, when they were using it for glaucoma, they were finding that they were getting great eyelash growth. So now it's, it's probably a weak drug for glaucoma, so it's not that very popular for that, but it's much more popular uh, for use on the eyelash and eyebrow area to grow hair as you age. And it's very, it's actually very effective. It grows about 20 to 30 percent, maybe even 40 to 50 percent of the hair back if you tend to be, you know, 
if you tend to be hairy or if you're a certain ethnicity, but I'm finding my, you know, Southeast Asian Indian patients, my Latin patients, the ones Middle Eastern patients who tend to have been hairier when they were younger, tend to get a better response to the to Latisse in middle age and grow more eyelashes and grow more eyebrows. But I mean, if you're losing eye, uh, eyelash hair, it, will the, I mean, are the hair follicles dying too? And, and d- does Latisse just make the existing eyelashes longer or are you getting new hair? No. So, okay. So the re- reduction in estrogen levels as you get older causes a miniaturization, miniaturization of the hair follicle. So the hair follicle is still present and can grow a hair. It's just a teeny tiny hair. So what, what Latisse does is it actually reverses this. And we're not exactly sure how it does it, but it's kind of similar to Rogaine, how that does that for the scalp. It reverses the miniaturization of the hair follicle. We think it's because both of these medications, these topical medications, deliver a small amount of increased vascularity and some growth factors to the actual hair follicle that then causes it to re- to normalize again and grow a normal hair. What about side effects? Are there any risks of using this? Um, the only the only side effects that we're know that are in the package insert for Latisse come from the Lumigan studies, where if you were somebody with a blue iris, meaning blue eyes, and you got a substantial amount of the product in your eye, it could change the color of your iris temporarily from green from blue or green to brown. Um, we have not seen this in conjunction with its use for eyebrows or eyelashes because, you know, purportedly you don't get even an actual one whole drop into your eye, so there should be no issue with that. Okay, all so right, and that and one, that's a good solution, or are there others? That's a great solution. Um, you know, the, in this, the cosmetic industry, which is not me, but, you know, sort of around me, is making a lot of money, and it's becoming huge. People are doing this, this microplaning and then the lash bars. I don't know if you've seen them yet on the west coast of Florida, but they're popping up in every strip mall in, on the east coast of Florida where you can get lashes uh, done in a variety of ways. And, it's you know, having really full lashes is becoming trendy among young people, too, where you can either get them woven onto your the lashes you already have or you can have them glued on individually or even put on with, like, adhesive tape. And these can last anywhere from three to six weeks and uh, is also a popular uh, way to treat it. So mo- a lot of my patients are doing both. They're using Latisse, and they're getting tem- false eyelashes. Now, call me um, crazy, Mon- call me crazy, Manjula, but to me that sounds like you're inviting a lot of bacteria to, to be right near um, your eyes. Well, they do it in a sterile fashion. I'm not seeing, and my, my colleagues too, we're not seeing a lot of infections because nothing is going in the eyes on the top eyelid, sort of above the the area of the eyelash margin. If they're actually weaving it onto the eyelash, perhaps that might be a little bit more problematic, but actually those patients have less of a problem because the biggest problem we see is an is allergy to the glue or to the adhesive. We don't really see much in the way of eye infection. Okay, well, that's encouraging. All right, so much to know and and great to know that there are solutions. And what about in the future? Do you think we're going to have a way to just regrow eyebrow hair in the future? So the other thing that we're doing interesting is that we're using platelet-rich plasma or plasma injections to grow head hair. And a lot of us are doing it for the eyebrows as well. It's difficult to inject into the eye lash area, but I think um, doing platelet-rich uh, plasma or PRP injections for the eyebrows is going to be a wave of the future. And believe it or not, the transplant surgeons, the hair transplant surgeons in all over Florida, whenever patients present with reduced scalp hair, they often recommend them to do a little bit of transplant <laughs> And the eyebrows as well. And so that's coming too. Okay. All right. Well, we'll be on the lookout for that. And we want to talk about much more. So Dr. Manjula Jagasothi, please stick around. And everybody listening, you stay around too. When we come back, we're going to talk about a very tricky area of fat to treat. Manjula is going to give us some solutions. This is Health Check with Heidi Godman on WSRQ. We'll be right back. For you, sweet happy life. 
Welcome back to Health Check. I'm Heidi Godman. So you are eating right and you're exercising and you're strength training and you're stretching and you're toning. And there's this one stubborn area that is not changing, and that is right above the bra line. What do you do? We have some answers. My guest today is Dr. Manjula Jegasothi. She's an aesthetic dermatologist and the founder of the Miami Skin Institute. And Manjula, that's really an area that I I don't think a lot of people are thinking about, but probably a lot of people are dealing with. Yes. In fact, it's a huge unmet need. I always say that you know, the people who take the most care of their looks, such as Hollywood and models and actresses, who are very thin and try very hard to look good, um, often have this as a problem. And it's one of those problems that you don't realize is a problem until you're actually in a bathing suit or you're in that strapless dress for your wedding or you're in that spaghetti strap dress for a, a charity gala or function and all of a sudden you can see that, you know, the sort of the edges of your breast when being pushed up become, you know, look fat in that kind of dress. And uh, frankly, plastic surgeons can't really do a lot of liposuction in that area because it's a very delicate area that has a lot of nerves and, and arteries and veins and even breast tissue that's close by. And so it's a little bit harsh to put in a liposuction cannula. So it's always been an area that's very difficult to exercise off. The people who have no bra fat, bra line fat there tend to be almost, you know, mostly underweight. So it's hard to maintain a healthy weight and have none of that. And then it's also difficult to treat it surgically. So we've had nothing to treat it until now with uh, Kybella. Kybella. Now, isn't that the injection for for fat areas right under the chin and on the neck, the double chin? Yes. So the double chin on the neck is another place that, it was difficult to really get all of the fat cells with liposuction because there's so many structures and nerves and, and arteries there. And so it's very similar to the bra line. Um, and so Kybella was uh, FDA approved a year and a half ago uh, to treat this next fat. And a lot of us are using it now in what we call in an off-label in a different body area to treat uh, the bra line fat. It's very similar in composition and in amount to the neck fat. And so we found that it's a good treatment for it. All right. So what about risks involved? Um, you know, I definitely recommend that you go to somebody who's who's done a lot of cases of raw line fat. Um, they can show you good before and afters, et cetera. Um, there's no real downside because uh, Kybella has been formulated really just to melt the fat of fat cells, you know, the the cell membrane of fat cells, it doesn't really um, touch other structures. It doesn't doesn't affect muscle tissue or arteries or nerves or veins. That being said, if if the fat cells where you're treating have a lot of blood vessels feeding them, you might get some bruising, which can persist up to about 10 days. But other than that, there's no real um, there's no real adverse events. There's certainly no long term adverse events. Short term adverse events are anything that with a needle you might get some swelling that might persist. Um, as the fat cells are actually broken up, you might have some tenderness. You might get some inflammation because you know we our bodies our immune systems take away the fat that's being broken up by the by the medication. Um, and that's about it. It really it's very safe. All right. It's very safe. How long does it last? So, you know, again, this is done dependent on dosing and who you see and somebody who's well-versed in it. Technically, um, if the fat cells are treated, if the right dosing is given for the right patient and injected in the right area, once the fat cells are gone, they're not going back. You never grow back fat cells. Let's say when you get liposuction, the area where you have liposuction is unlikely to become, you know, extremely fat again unless there were a lot of fat cells left there. So in a thin patient, and I always say for Kybella patients, they should be within 10%, 10 to 15% of their ideal body weight given their height. And if you are, then, you know, once all the fat cells are gone in that area, they will not come back. Okay, but what about the risk of other cells being zapped that you don't want to be zapped or or nerves or something like that? You're talking about the importance of going to a really skilled, trained expert. And and I would worry that there could be these risks. 
Well, I mean, Tibella itself is um, it's deoxyfolate, which is a known bile salt. It's actually as similar. It's, it's it's exactly the composition of of bile acid that we make in our gallbladder. So it's a it's an actual synthetically derived version of a natural product we already produce, and it only emulsifies fat cells. Um, it if if it's injected in our in the wrong area, what can happen is your own body's immune system, your inflammatory cells can come there and create problems for that area, but even those would be temporary. Um, so there's no real way the actual kybella or the deoxycholate can injure other tissues. It just might be your inflammatory response if it's injected wrongly. Okay. All right. Well, that's encouraging. So much to know. And thank goodness we have great docs like you who are just staying on top of all of this. And you founded the Miami Skin Institute. Tell us what you do. Okay, I founded the Miami Skin Institute, which is my aesthetic dermatology practice located in Coral Gables, um, a suburb of Miami, in 2000. So I've been in practice 17 years. And I started out uh, part general dermatology and part aesthetic dermatology. And now, uh, for the last five years or so, I've been entirely practicing entirely aesthetic dermatology uh, with an eye toward forward looking innovative procedures that other uh, aesthetic physicians do not do, um, and we talked about some of them today, the platelet-rich uh, plasma injections to grow hair and eyebrows, and then Kybella for the bra line, um, and also I've, I like to think of myself as sort of forward thinking with social media. Um, any of our uh, listeners can listen to any of our radio shows on my iTunes channel, uh, which is called Miami Skin Institute. Um, and then also you can visit me on the web at MiamiSkinInstitute.com. I have a WordPress and Google Plus blog. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, and uh, I have I post regularly, almost daily, to Twitter, uh, Instagram, and Facebook. So media savvy. So fun to talk to you. But, <laughs> but don't go away because we want to keep on talking to you. I know you have some great news about what celebrities are doing for their skin. You hear about that a lot. Is it safe? Is it healthy? We're going to find out. So everybody, please stick around. More with Dr. Manjula Jegasothi, an aesthetic dermatologist from the Miami Skin Institute. More with Manjula in just a minute. This is Health Check with Heidi Godman on WSRQ. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Health Check. I'm Heidi Godman. We've been speaking today with Dr. Manjula Jegasothi. She's an aesthetic dermatologist and the founder of the Miami Skin Institute. We check in with her every month because she's always keeping ahead of the trends for us and telling us how to handle all these skin issues that we need to stay on top of and sometimes fat issues too. And today we are going to be talking now about what celebrities do, because you see these things on television or you read about them on the internet. And Manjula, it always seems like the celebrities are ahead of the curve. And some of them, some of these things seem pretty silly and some seem really great. What's the latest? So, you know, if you are a celebrity and you're in the public eye and you're being photographed by paparazzi, even when you go to the grocery store, it's kind of part of your job to look as good as possible <laughs> all the time, you know, more so than for the rest of us. So what they're doing tends to be cutting edge because they probably spend a lot more thought and planning and have teams of people thinking about it for them also. Um, so I think the latest trends I think everyone notices when they see celebrities at the Oscars and the Tonys and such is that um, they're getting they're looking more and more natural as they age. You know, gone are the days of the um, you know two and three multiple facelifts and and eye surgeries and all those things, so that they actually look you know not only older and different, but they they they're unrecognizable as they get into their fifth and sixth decades of life, trying to get keep their careers going. So what I'm seeing a lot in my practice with celebrities and models and actresses is that they're starting earlier. They're getting Botox and, you know, from their early thirties onward. And then they're also doing frequent laser treatments, um, whether it's radio frequency or fraxel or a combination of both 
You can do very light treatments of these where you're just pink for a few hours and you're fine by the next day. And if you keep that up, uh, most of them are doing it on a monthly basis or so. Uh, you really don't have any downtime and you can keep your skin tight and t- toned and, you know, elastic for years longer than, you know, waiting to just pull it up later on with a facelift. Okay, so so you can start earlier, and that makes a difference. I mean, doesn't doesn't some of the the treatment that you might do when you're young doesn't it wear off and not ha- stay as effective as you get a little older? Actually, what it's what the data now shows is doing things like Botox or maybe even a little bit of filler earlier keeps your fibroblasts, which is the cells in the dermis, the second layer of skin that produce collagen, it keeps them more active for longer. So it actually helps your skin keep itself younger, these treatments. And that's kind of the basis behind doing it when you're younger because, you know, it kind of keeps them working at a level that's, um, you know, akin to being 30 rather than being 50 or 60. And, you know, this is something that we are only seeing that's been borne out by time with people doing these treatments monthly and indeed looking younger. You know, for example, most people come in and ask me, you know, how does J-Lo look so good? How does Jennifer Lopez look so good? She's almost 50. And, you know, I know people who take care of Jennifer Lopez, and it really is that she started Botox in her early 30s and then started doing, you know, monthly treatments with radiofrequency and Fraxel and continues that. She's never had any kind of surgical intervention. Um, and then a lot of us who are getting into, you know, the aesthetic dermatologists themselves who are getting into their, you know, 50s and 60s, we look a lot younger than our older counterparts who are, you know, in their 70s and 80s because we started these treatments when we were younger. And so it's just been experience that shows but it actually helps if you start these treatments younger and do them on, a, you know, do very light treatments, but on a very regular basis. Okay, so you could do Botox earlier, and then I know during the commercial break, you and I were talking about other things that celebrities do. They have laser treatments that they get every month, and also they do PRP injections in their face. Tell us about those. So platelet-rich plasma is, uh, we mentioned it for the uh, growth of eyebrows and and head hair, scalp hair. Um, Essentially, it's taking your own blood and breaking open the platelets um, using a centrifuge machine, and that releases the growth factors that you use. For example, when you get a cut, the platelets come into the area and they're cut open, and the growth factors help you heal the wound. In much the same way, These growth factors injected into any area of the skin on the face or body can cause the skin to grow collagen in a much more accelerated fashion than it would otherwise given the person's age. And so that's very helpful in just keeping your skin looking young and toned and elastic and all the things we attribute to young skin. Okay, so PRP might be something and laser, getting laser every month? Yes. So alternating the radio frequency laser, which is the tightening laser, it basically causes collagen contraction in the deep layer of the skin, which tightens the skin, and then alternating that with Fraxel. Fraxel causes microscopic little holes in the skin, which are then, um, then collagen grows into them within 24 hours. Um, and these are the treatments we were hoping that sort of as peels became more advanced, they would do. Um, but the pe- but peels really, if you go past the epidermis with a peel, you're going to have a four or five uh, day downtime. And most of these celebrities can't simply do that. They're, they've got social events and, and appearances and such to do that they can't, you know, be hiding in the house for four or five days. And so these lasers have picked up where peels really couldn't. And so they go deeper. They go into the dermis but because they only treat parts partial skin, you know, they only treat microscopic areas of the skin with normal skin in between, they heal within 24 hours, and you can get the results you want without the downtime. Okay, so celebrities are doing that every month. Are there any risks of doing that? You know, you again, you need to go to somebody who's good, because if you go to somebody who doesn't understand the laser or your skin type, you know, you can definitely get burned by any any electric device. Um so that's important. Um, thankfully, most of these light lasers, the radio frequency and, and fractal, if you do get a slight burn, you know, it's a matter of a few days before that top layer of skin gloss off and you're fine. 
But, you know, you need to go to a doctor that knows how to manage if there's pigmentary issues afterwards, if you get redness or hyperpigmentation, brown spots, etc. cetera. Um, that's why I don't really advocate um, going to med spas for these types of lasers on the face because often these operators are, you know, not physicians and they've been trained for maybe six or eight weeks from the laser company. And so that's where we're seeing a lot of the trope. All the celebrities are going to be certified dermatologists for these procedures. Okay. Well, I guess if we want to be celebrities, we know where to go. Dr. Manjula <laughs> Jegasothi, thank you so much for giving us all of your insight and spending so much time with us today. And if we want to get a hold of you, we can go to MiamiSkinInstitute.com. And I know you have links to all the other media you're involved with there. Thank you so much for being on the program today. Thank you very much, Heidi. Have a great day. Okay. Talk to you soon. Everybody, again, okay. that's, that's Dr. Manjula Jagasothi, and you can check her out at Miami Skin Institute.